outside of cryptocurrencies because indeed this technology is absolutely universal and starting to be appeased. So ladies and gents, now we have come to the last chapter of our second section. So to sum up uh, our wonderful discussions about the regulations and compliance in crypto markets, we'd like to welcome here for the panel discussion the moderator of this panel, Levin Lee, the Chief Compliance from Stealth Fintech. Ms. Lee, please join us on stage. Joining Ms. Lee is Nick Kozlov, the bank and team lead from One Inch, Adam Berger, the senior legal counselor from Mercurio, and Yael Tamar, the CEO at Solid Block. They will share their perspectives on the complex interplay between regulation, compliance, and the crypto industry. Please, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I think you're missing me. Well, okay. Right, okay. Um, unfortunately, I think uh, we're running over a bit of time, and hopefully this is quite short, and we can go for your lunch. Um, firstly, um, thank you for the panellists, and uh, could you please um, introduce yourself briefly? Uh, of course, Yale just uh, did a great presentation, but um, Adam, here you go. Hey everyone, uh, nice to meet you all here. Uh, my name is Adam Berker. I'm a senior legal counsel at Mercurio. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, everything related to regulation and especially crypto regulation. Uh, and uh, also I work with licensing, uh, obtaining them, maintaining them, and researching uh, all the jurisdictions where uh, new crypto licensing requirements uh, may, uh, where regulators uh, introduce new crypto licensing uh, in the regulation. Cool. I think that the first question I have, um, based on what you just mentioned, is um, obviously in my presentation I also mentioned that whether the regulator is embracing the democratization of finance or digitization of assets. Uh, what are your thoughts and when you set up business, particularly for um, Yell and Mikro uh, going to new markets, is there any particularly countries that you're looking for and any license that you think might um, have advanced for the business? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, so uh, the searching and selecting special countries for licensing always depends on business needs, uh, first of all. And like I always say, like for example, we in Mercurio we have our own parameters uh, which we look at, or which we look at where we incorporate and obtain license in the, uh, this separate country. Um, for us, it's important to have a smooth, easy uh, customer onboarding procedure uh, to have a um, really uh, understanding, uh, clear. Uh, regulations uh, have a good good relationship with the regulator itself um, but uh, you know like today uh, there are lots of new jurisdictions that you, that companies can can search for uh, one of them is for example Hong Kong uh, like a very popular one today because they uh, they attract companies bigger biggest companies all over the world they started they inter they introduced their regulation I think on June 1st. Uh, and they attracted uh, biggest companies, I think about 40 uh, exchanges uh, are planning to incorporate them. And they also, uh, what's interesting is that they also, the regulators, they encourage financial institutions, especially banks, to, um, uh, to cooperate with crypto companies, to open uh, Bank accounts for them, which is like a big, biggest one of the biggest problems in the crypto industry, especially for exchanges, for us too, like to open a bank account. So yeah, like I think I think companies can look at Hong Kong, also Dubai, with a very clear, detailed regulation. Like they have like the, I think the most detailed guidelines for for companies there. Uh, yeah, but like it all depends on the business needs, I think. Um. This was a great answer by Adam. The only thing that I can add you know, uh, from what you asked, Levin, is 
and we have regulations in various countries to generally protect individual investors. And so, <laughs> hi, welcome, Nick. Hi, Nick. So, what we are, um, you know, what they're concerned with normally, and it's important for anybody to understand that's opening a crypto-related business or a blockchain-related business, is they need to understand the, which product they're selling and to whom. And this is the most important thing is, from, from our perspective, we work with securities, so it's less important for us, let's say, what crypto regulations uh, uh, are within a certain country, but more what are the security regulations, and if the regulator has set rules for um, how these, uh, usually you look at how your product is sold, right? The marketing part, solicitation, you look at custody, Right, how your product is stored, you know, who is the custodian, if they self-custody, if they, uh, there is a third-party custodian, what kind of licenses they need, and how these custodians um, are connected to, let's say, traditional you know, bank accounts and things like that. So maybe there's a wallet with a bank. So in, in setting any sort of a crypto business or even a fund or an investment operation and so on, it's essentially a subsection of fintech in my mind. I don't know if Adam would agree. I guess, yes. Yeah, so it's basically, in fintech, there's lots of licenses and compliance. It's nothing new. You used to have, let's say, banking or financial institution. You always have lawyers on staff, compliance officers, and so on. Now we're adding another complexity of this crypto regulation that's forthcoming. And you always have this kind of ongoing struggle to know all the new regulations. And now there is this Mika thing is coming up that I'd love to hear more from the panelists here. Um, but at the end of the day, the regulations here to generally help and they are forthcoming and they want to listen and communicate. So that's kind of been our experience too, that we'll, uh, we get all the, most of the answers we, we need to get in our industry, which is securities, digital securities, so, hi. Hi, Nick, and um, would you like to quickly, briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm very sorry for the late. I had a workshop, a small delay. Um, so, uh, I'm Nick Koslo, I'm a backend team lead at Vanage. Um, before Vanage, I was working at Trust Wallet at Binance as a backend team lead as well. And before that, I actually was a founder of my own company. So, I'm a fifth, I think, from 2017. I uh, had small experience with building some D-apps, uh, on, mostly on focused on DeFi and Ethereum. And currently, I'm also working at Vanish with uh, compliance. So I'm a bit technical guy from the compliance side and mostly focused on compliance at DeFi specifically. So over last year, I had a bit, uh, a, a pretty good vision of what is happening from the side, from the regulator side and how we need to implement it, how we need to force it. And yeah, I have a small vision about that, I think. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, I, th I think from what I hear from the panelists, Adam and Yo is talking about, and then they are talking about compliance, is that we all, in the business, we all need clarity. We all need a certainty from different regulators. Obviously, we're looking for that harmonization across the globe because that it creates, I think, the regulatory arbitrage. One is creating problems for business in order to, in the plain um, plan field. And the other is it creates operational challenges uh, when you have different requirements, as I mentioned, the KYC requirement, as you say, easy to onboard customers and straightforward and have, you know, a, a, I think practically implementable um, regulatory requirements and it's actually ready to protect the consumers. And from that, I want to kind of get into a little bit deeper. As a business, what do you see the challenges with the makeup coming into Europe and probably is impacting your business heavily? Adam, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I think that um, well, like the challenges that the companies will see, will face after the Mika uh, comes into force, uh, these challenges may affect, on the one hand, uh, centralized services like Mercurial, and on the other hand, decentralized like uh, one inch uh, of NIC. 
um, as well as centralized. Um, I think that uh, this will cover, like, first of all, um, as you said, the, the onboarding procedure, and on the on the other hand, um, the maintaining of business relationship with customers, because uh, the Mika and the documents that uh, go with it. Uh, like, for example, like I think I think that th this was already mentioned today that they will introduce travel rule uh, all over the EU and uh, centralized the centralized services will have to not only check uh, KYC their own customers but also the KYC the recipients of the funds and like this will be like a big challenge for for all the companies. I think that for example in uh, South Korea uh, they have already introduced this kind of system uh, of travel rule system but it's like a private one um, and like it's not working as it should be at the moment but it's been I think one or two years already uh, since its launch. Um, also like for example, like for centralized services, we already have our uh, KOC processes uh, set up. But as for the one inch, for example, like uh, you, for example, like as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but your users, they just like have to connect their wallets, like uh, non-custodial wallets, uh, not to go undergo any KYC, uh, just to like exchange their funds. Uh, uh, yeah, it's correct. However, we have some uh, on-chain comp like on compliance, so we use several partners to verify that address is not rely, rely on, it's not actually a hacker. But yeah, like yeah, we, have, we mostly we don't have KYC right now for the DM, of course. Yeah, but but, but, but like the, with the new regulations, like uh, all the regulations, they want to they want to control uh, every area, almost every area, and that's what I think this will be the challenge for the non-custodial services. Um, but on the other hand, I, I think that I, I will pass the word to, to my colleagues and maybe we can go back uh, to this. Probably this is not really relevant, but yeah, it, 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 it is relevant, but I think this was, this was a great yeah, and compli you know, compo um, comprehensive. Yeah, and I, I want to add that and probably I see some of the segregation and custodian of client funds, and this is technically when I was at Crypto.com, you know, when you are operating global business, and trying to adopt to the local regulations where you have to segregate and the custody locally, this creates a huge operational challenges. And going back to your question about KYC, um, travel rule, and in the UK, I think Europe, um, uh, Coinbase lead the trust the solution, which is kind of typically coming from the um, crypto community, which we don't normally see in the traditional banking world, um, I believe. So um, I want to go to the floor because I think I know we have a limited um, time. Does anybody have any question for our panelists? Any questions? No? There we are. There's one. Sorry, this is a bit random. I just thought <laughs> I wanted to delay everybody's lunch and then hopefully we can... Hello. Uh, my question, I think it's mainly for me. Uh, my question is about how can you identify uh, the address of a hacker? Uh, if they create a new one, how do you know uh, it's a hacker? And the second question, do you believe they can uh, KYC, uh, DeFi, or anything that is centralized? Do you believe like, they can find the address and get KYC from them? Um, it's a good question. So I decided with this one. Uh, basically, currently we use our partners who help us to identify hackers and address. Even if they make several transactions, we still have a tree of all transactions for any address, and we can actually identify how any hacker transfer its own funds across multiple addresses. And uh, it's pretty interesting because we require to have very small interval, like very small latency. So if hacker made a transaction to the new address, we need to be faster than hacker to ban this hacker on this address. However, actually it's quite hard to theoretically ban everyone there. Because, because of the nature of Ethereum, the only option to be completely compliant friendly is to have only by least only uh, solution. It's impossible in current DeFi to demand 100% compliance, doesn't matter which provider or which rule you're using, because Hacker can all, all, always can make multiple transactions inside uh, one transaction. 
What, what does, do I mean? I, you can potentially, for example, make a transfer from Tornado Cache Creator to a new address and generate future new addresses and future new transfers inside one atomic transaction on the blockchain side. And in this moment, it's almost impossible to track that uh, on the side of the compliance. Doesn't matter which like, engine do you use. That's why the only solution for that is actually whitelisting. Currently, we don't have whitelist because we can defy, but we're trying to monitor basic cases. Most of the cases are not that complex. It requires a lot of resources for hackers to do something like that. So we are mostly focusing on basic like, hackers that are not really smart in this way. And we do all of that actually through our partners. We work with the Telegram Labs, one of the best like, part, like, compliance providers on the market, and we are pretty happy to work with them. Um, answering the second question, can you please repeat a bit? Uh, I think it's already started. Actually, we can see that in, the, in DeFi we, we have some QRC starting because of the SBT tokens. It's a pretty good concept right now. Like when you do QRC, for example, on Binance, you can get an SBT token and use this Soul Power token that you proceed this QRC with the lifetime, for example, for one week. And you can actually we can check that if this address have QRC on Binance, potentially you can actually don't check that it's it's already QRC with this partner. That's quite a good approach and uh, it's pretty not hard to make such requirements on chain so we can verify that specific address must have SBT with the lifetime smaller than like one week. So yeah, I think it's quite possible to do QRC. It's not a big thing actually for the DeFi. It's quite easy to implement that from the technical side. The more higher challenges are with the compliance side because it requires constant monitoring on each transaction. It's, quite, it's much more harder than doing QRC. Great, I love to hear that. <laughs> As I said, you know, we always come with uh, questions and problems and the, the, as industry, I think of the solutions, there's always a way find the solutions, right? Um, any other questions? No? I actually have a, um, a question. As um, for all the panelists, so we see, you know, today um, we're very exciting about the opportunities that the, 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 the blockchain is bringing and the, the kind of a new frontier in front of us. As business, uh, what do you look forward to see in the next, let's say, six to six months to a year? Because a year seems like 10 years in the traditional banking. Um, I, you know, what would you like to see in terms of within the crypto community or the firms or consumers or regulators, or authorities? What would you like to see to happen in the next six or a year's time? I know it's a very generic question, but um, hopefully it gives the, you know, thoughts for the floor. Um, I think uh, that we in Mercurio we are waiting for like as we mentioned before Mika and uh, because like it will offer us like a glo not global but uh, like a unified regulation all over the EU so like we have our so certain licenses in uh, some EU countries and then we can passport them all over uh, the other EU countries but I think that other regulators in other countries are also undertaking actions in order to unify uh, the regulation all over the, all over the world um, in order to have like a, a unifying, unified understanding or understanding of crypto itself, uh, of licensing regimes and this will help us to operate uh, in other countries too where we like we may be operating there but like we like we need a more clear uh, licensing regime there. Um, yeah, um, and on the other hand, I think that everybody, like in the uh, compliance, pre uh, compliance legal crypto world, is watching uh, at the uh, Securities Exchange Commission situation in the U.S. And because I think that um, the results of this battle between the Commission and the crypto industry will also affect uh, other countries especially EU, Asia, and like the approach that will be used in the US will be also transferred to other countries. Like, and if, if the, all the crypto is considered to be securities and they need this uh, regulatory regime, like all the, all, all the regulation and laws that were uh, approved uh, in the EU, I think they will also 
change in accordance with this new format, with this new trend, in, in my opinion. Um, for me, is the most the most important thing is to look into these existing industries that were before crypto for thousands of years, hundreds of years, and understand why things work in a certain way, and maybe not necessarily with respect to only regulation, but uh, also with respect to how the financial sector works, how the financial industry works, or why the crypto industry is basically uh, still a small industry. I don't know if that's only the fault of the regulators or it's the fault of the use cases that are limited to trading or gaming and why the institutions are you know, obviously coming in, but again, looking at crypto as an asset class that they can make money with and then abandon or temporarily and then come back and acquire again and causing you know now new types of cycles and where crypto is going to go in terms of technology or in terms of an asset class that's actually much bigger right so we have in the global economy of course we have energy which is used by everyone every day and even our industry is hugely dependent on energy that's obvious and we have uh, IT obviously and everything related to development and that, that's fueled usually normally still fueled by securities and you know startups and exchanges uh, that are compliant and regulated and these companies uh, very few companies are trading in a decentralized manner right yeah. and then we have real estate and other types of assets where people live which people use and so on which is again still fueled largely by traditional investment vehicles and institutions I would like to see the merge of the two, and I would like for crypto to graduate in some way into um, an asset class that is useful for uh, many other things. And then I think that you know that's where we're going as a company, as uh, SolidBlock and our new uh, iteration called Dips Capital, as a as a as a bridge where um, will allow private securities. In fact, if if any of these companies, if any of the new iterations of let's say crypto considered to be security, and we'll be able to provide global and decentralized, even to an extent, manner of uh, an exchange of these securities between various parties. And um, the only thing that needs to be centralized really is the KYC AML and accreditation, right? And it really needs to be centralized because every party uh, shouldn't be KYCing. You cannot trust other people to KYC unless, you know, in the, what Nick was saying, that they trust, or some parties trust finance to do KYC, AML, and, um, and uh, proof of address and things like that, which is great. We need to have a trustworthy, maybe bank or financial institution that is licensed properly to do these things, and then we can rely on that as kind of the base. The rest of the things still can be decentralized. What do you think, Nick? In shortly TLDR, I think it will be put a large fight across the free world and current compliance regulators. And my main take is that I think that currently the regulators are trying to bring 30 years old practices to the deeper free world. And they first they can't actually realize that it's not going to work like that. And it's pretty obvious, it's pretty the same for any industry as we already discussed it, because the regulators came to some sphere, they start to think, okay, what if we will don't have any regulation? Let's take a look what will happen. Okay, looks looks bad. Let's try to make very strict regulation. Maybe somebody will survive. Maybe somebody will try to sue us and go fight, fight back. And this is actually what is happening right now. Firstly, we don't have any regulation. Right now we have extremely strict regulation, especially at the United States, and nobody can get any license or like anything, and everybody, everyone running out of it. I think the next couple of years we will have something like a wave of regulation between Asia, Europe, and the United States, where we will have firstly very easy regulation, for example, in the United States, what we already had before, it will be very strict right now there, and Asia APEC regions will have much more transparent regulation for the crypto, what we are happy, what's happening right now, and it will be like a constant battle between the free world that will try to change the geography, the entities, 
and trying to explain the regulators the situation, what is happening, why it's impossible to do such thing as complete, like a complete AML for the DeFi. Like from my point of view, there for the, the real requirements that are tra they're trying to push right now, it's almost impossible to implement in DeFi right now. It's just it will kill the whole industry completely. It will be a different industry, and of course, it will not happen like that from my point of view, and it will be constant like. It will be a pretty large discussion for the next years, and rules will be constantly changing. It will make everything. It will slow down everything. Actually, it's quite a pessimistic situation because all this industry, all the businesses here, try to be compliant as much as possible. But with the constant changing of rules, it will be quite hard. So I think it will be a pretty large battle, and maybe only companies who are, will be very aggressive on that and will try to understand that in some regions the compliance is a bit better right now it will survive. Yeah. I, I totally agree. I think that as you know business or compliance officers that professionals that we're all in